Senator Sezelja, Bronwyn Bishop, there are calls for her to detail what parliamentary business she was conducting in Albury on the weekend of Sophie Mirabella's wedding. Are those calls fair enough? Uh, well, I think what Bronwyn has said is that um, she was doing some committee business as, in her role as committee chair. Um, I don't know what that business was. That, that's really a matter for her. I mean, I think certainly I was reflecting on this. I mean, my, in my role as a committee chair, certainly there are times uh, when you would meet with individuals. Sometimes uh, they might be whistleblowers. I don't know whether that's the case here. I haven't heard that said. But uh, there, there is a, a time and a place for doing that. So uh, I think... Um, we need to distinguish between you know, what's been paid back, uh, obviously, uh, in relation to Bronwyn Bishop and the very legitimate work that, um, that parliamentarians do all of the time where there is no doubt uh, that they should be able to claim and uh, getting, getting around the country in terms of your role as a committee chair uh, where there is legitimate committee business uh, is, clearly fits into that category. So as committee chair you might not be aware there might not be paperwork that details where you or members of a committee may be at any one time and how that fits into the committee work. I mean the, the suggestion mm. here is if she's doing parliamentary work there's a paper trail, mm. but that's what, not necessarily the case? Well, in the ordinary course of events, obviously, if there's a committee hearing uh, mm. or committee meetings, there would be. Uh, but if it's, if it's some other uh, investigative work as, as part of the role of committee chair, then, then obviously it, it might be the circumstance where that isn't documented. And I just don't know what the circumstances are here. Uh, but it's, not, uh, it, it's a legitimate thing, I think, for a committee chair uh, in their role uh, to be, in some cases, uh, meeting with people who may want to raise serious concerns about an ongoing inquiry. Uh, it may not always be the case that you want to publicise those meetings. Now, I don't know whether that's the case here, but that is something that uh, will occur from time to time. I guess the suspicion here, and in other cases, if I can broaden it out, is that sometimes politicians are within their entitlements, but essentially what they're doing is inventing some sort of parliamentary business because they want to go to a certain location for a private function or, say, a party political function. Is, it, is that a legitimate concern? Well, obviously, if, it, if, that's, if that's the motivation, I think that that uh, is a legitimate concern, but I don't think anyone can say what the motivation is in any of these particular cases. I think as parliamentarians, we have to be able to justify uh, our travel. Uh, you know, we do, I'm, I sit on about eight committees. Uh, we do a lot of committee travel. Uh, we have a, a limited entitlement to travel for electorate purposes as well. Uh, we should use that, you know, prudently. Uh, we should use that to try and do our jobs as effectively as we can as parliamentarians. And certainly our jobs are not just here in Canberra. Uh, they are right around the nation in our various roles. So that is very legitimate. When people do that, I suppose it's, it's fair to say that parliamentarians across the spectrum have probably tried that on from time to time. Uh, and I think that um, sometimes they get caught out, and when they get caught out, uh, they deserve to be criticised. So you say um, parliamentarians need to justify their travel. Does that mean in Brown Bishop's case with this trip to Albury, she really does have to spell out what parliamentary business she was conducting there? Well, I think she's already said uh, the nature of the business. So uh, it's really a question of if people are now saying that, that she's somehow not telling the truth. And I'm certainly not prepared to say that. I don't believe that. Uh, so, you know, she's can, out. can you understand the scepticism yeah. perhaps amongst the public? Well, look, uh, perhaps amongst some, uh, but uh, I would say on this, I think that there's been a little bit of an obsession. Uh, now, the issue, the initial issue, uh, which you know was a legitimate issue of public concern, and that's why Bronwyn paid the money back, that's why she paid it back with a penalty, uh, I think she's, she's got a cop it on that. Uh, but th there's a bit of an ongoing witch hunt now about every, every trip, and you know, parliamentarians travel right around the country on a regular basis, uh, the vast, vast bulk of it is 100% within entitlement and there's no doubt about it. Uh, so I think there is a little bit of a witch hunt going on at the moment. All right, let's move on. Um, the issue of same-sex marriage, you're a well-known opponent mm -hmm. of same-sex marriage. The, the proponents of same-sex marriage point to a series of opinion polls saying that the great majority of Australians are in favour of same-sex marriage. Do you accept those opinion polls are legitimate? Well, look, 
I mean, I'm not a commentator on opinion polls, but... Uh, you are but, a representative sure, of, sure. Of, of an yeah. electorate, though. But if you just let, allow me to answer, I mean, I think that there's been certainly some of the polls where they've claimed a certain amount of support have clearly been overstated. I mean, I'll give you one example. The Australian Marriage Equality claims, I think, 72 per cent support, and that often gets quoted. Yet the, the latest news poll, I think, showed a much lower number. I think still a majority, but in the 50s. So, you know, they can't both be right. Uh, so I think that there's obviously a greater discussion to be had. If people are going to claim that kind of overwhelming support, uh, then I think news poll does tend to be pretty well respected poll and you might look at that as being perhaps closer to the truth. Uh, clearly uh, I think that there are a lot of people who would say look in principle uh, you know when you ask the question do you support marriage equality I'm sure many Australians and, and probably a majority of Australians would probably say yes. When you drill down on other issues uh, it, it does people do people do tend to perhaps have a different view or certainly uh, when we have a discussion about you know, equality, uh, many people who have raised it with me are surprised to know that we actually got rid of uh, virtually all of the legal discrimination against same-sex couples a number of years ago when it comes to superannuation, when it comes to next of kin rights, when it comes to a whole range of other things. So uh, when that's part of the discussion, I think perhaps you'd get a slightly different answer. Does it make sense from what you said then to have a plebiscite? Because one, it will be a much more accurate measurement than any opinion poll could be. But also in the lead up to such a plebiscite, people would have to think through mm. all the implications of the issues you're suggesting, you know, on an opinion poll they're giving an mm. instant response. Does it make sense to have a plebiscite? Well look, in theory I'm certainly not opposed to the idea of on a range of issues, putting things to the people, and, and this would be no different. Uh, I, I'd make a couple of points on that. And I've, I've, I said in response to Ireland, I said, well, if you're going to make such a fundamental change, uh, like redefining marriage, then the way the Irish did it, putting it directly to the people uh, in a referendum in that case, uh, is certainly a, a pretty reasonable way of going about it, because you do give people the power. I'm certainly not calling for a plebiscite at the moment, but uh, I, I'm, I'm not in, in theory opposed to it. Uh, what I would say is I'm not hearing a clamour, uh, even here in my electorate here in the ACT, where people say, it's, you know, it's further to the left than the rest of the country or might, might have a stronger level of support for this issue. I'm not getting a strong clamour saying that this is an urgent issue, uh, that it is a top of mind issue, that it is a top 10 or top 15 or even top 20 issue for most people. Uh, I think, though, that people, uh, when they consider these issues, like a plebiscite in future and the like, certainly I've heard from people on both sides of the debate, people who support same-sex marriage, people who oppose same-sex marriage, saying, well, they think that it would be fairer that it's done directly by the people than perhaps in a parliamentary vote. Now, as you know, there is a cross-party push to sponsor some private, a private member's bill to legalise same-sex marriage, and there's a kind of a push, if I can characterise as that, for the Liberal Party to have a conscience vote or a free vote. Give us an insight into the dynamics inside the Liberal Party room, if you like. Is that likely to happen? Is there a, a, a groundswell or do you think it's just the opposite is happening? Uh, well, I'm, I'm certainly not picking up a groundswell to have a, a free vote on this issue within the coalition. I mean, other people have a different view, obviously, and, and there are clearly some who are calling for that. But my assessment would be that there's uh, still a minority and in fact a pretty significant majority uh, who oppose that view within the coalition. Um, and I think that obviously what's happened in the Labor Party has actually undermined their calls to try and to try and say to the coalition, well, you need to have a free vote. Well, firstly, we don't expel people when they when they cross the floor. That's the first thing. The second thing is the Labor Party are now moving to bind their MPs and senators. They're not going to do it immediately, but they will be doing it in coming years. So it's a bit rich for Bill Shorten to say to us, well, you have to have a free vote when his party. Uh, has just said that, that his members and senators in future will be bound and will be in fact expelled from the Labor Party if they don't toe the party line. That's from uh, 2019 and uh, the assumption there that many people are making is the reason it's 2019, the locked in vote, is because there's many people in the Labor Party that who believe that this issue will be resolved one way or the other before 2019. What, what's your thoughts? Well, it may or may not, but the point is, it's a, it's a, a absolutely hypocritical uh, for you for Bill Short. I and mean, Bill Short now has no credibility. If he stands up, I think as he has again recently and said the coalition has to have a free vote. Well, 
Bill Shorten's party just said they don't want it to be a free vote anymore. Now, we've got a compromise where, where, where they're able to have you know, a period of time where it will remain a free vote, but they are completely being contradictory because they are going to bind their MPs and senators. And I heard Penny Wong, uh, Penny Wong at the ALP conference, she said uh, the Labor Party has voted now to, uh, to make this uh, a binding vote on something that never should have been a conscience vote in the first place. Well, that's the Labor Party's view. Uh, they certainly don't have any credibility telling us what we should be doing. OK, final issue. Um, the government wants to set up this uh, think tank, if I can put it like that, research institute headed by the controversial uh, Danish academic Bjorn Lomborg. Now, the latest location that's been muted is Flinders University in Adelaide. There seems to be uh, people objecting to that, both academic students at the university but also the state Labor government. Mm. Um, isn't that their right? Well, uh, you know, I think there's a real attempt to stifle academic freedom here. Uh, the idea that because someone says something that other people don't agree with, that they don't have a place at our universities, as seemed to be the conclusion at UWA uh, when this was rejected, is quite extraordinary and quite dangerous. I think it was quite cowardly uh, that UWA caved to that kind of pressure, and I would, I would think that it would reflect very poorly on Flinders University if they were effectively dictated to by Jay Weatherill on what they should have at their university. I mean, is that, is that what we're going to have now? If, if, if Flinders University now turns around and rejects Bjorn Lomborg, uh, who, whilst he may be controversial, is very well respected around the world as well. He's got his, he's got his critics uh, and he's got his supporters. He's an academic who puts out a lot of ideas and certainly I think he raises some very significant issues. If they're going to be dictated to by Jay Weatherill and the South Australian Labor government, uh, then that will seriously damage their academic credibility because they will effectively be saying, the state Labor government can tell us what to do and we won't bring on people who may not, who may not share the state Labor government's view of the world. A contrary interpretation, though, is that the federal government simply does not trust the collective wisdom of the entire Australian academic community, all the universities, uh, the Academy of Science, Australian Academy of Science, and is dedicating $4 million of money to a particular academic with a particular view of the world. What's your reaction to that view? Well, centres are often set up uh, and governments often give money for various centres that are set up at universities. That's not uncommon. The Labor government did that uh, and the coalition government is seeking to do that here. What we want is a diversity of opinion. There's so no, there's, there's there's no there's, so there's, there's not enough diversity in opinion well, in, this, in Australian academics on the issue I would of think, climate change? I would think the reaction to this suggests there isn't. I mean, if, if the reaction is that someone who, who isn't even a climate change sceptic but simply says there are better ways to do things, there are things that he thinks should be focused on ahead of some of the responses to climate change, and particularly things like carbon taxes, if, if, if there's a reaction like we're seeing to Bjorn Lomborg, then that would suggest that there isn't the diversity that we want to see. But I'd make this point. You know, we often hear from universities uh, that they don't have enough funding, uh, yet there's funding here. but in some parts of academia because they don't agree with this particular individual, they'd like to shout them down. Uh, surely there's space for Bjorn Lomborg at our universities and his vehement critics because they certainly are at our universities at the moment uh, and I'm certainly not saying they shouldn't be there. They're free to criticise him. He should be free to make his case. Okay, Senator Seth Zelja, thanks for your time. My pleasure. Thank you.